Welcome to another episode of Mind Deck Books. This time it's the day of the Triffids. 228 pages, sci-fi post-apocalyptic nightmare. One of our childhood favorites, <laughs> at least mine. Adam, who's joining us today, also said it was his childhood favorite. Yes, hello. <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks for having me. So also Paul came back to join us on mm. this adventure. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I didn't read this when I was a child. That was exactly my question. So you just... I read it like two years ago. Mm -hmm. So you both re-read it, but you re-listened. <laughs> the audiobook's really good. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. Do they have multiple actors for multiple voices? No, it's just one no, guy like doing that. everything. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we don't like that here, so no. No, thank you. No, the letter is really good. It has kind of the the is the style where it sounds like the book is kind of old, okay. like the old old sci-fi voice. Mm. <laughs> uh, it sounds uh, <laughs> like um, like it's he's reading like an interview almost, like an interview almost. Kind oh, that's of, like, interesting. Reading a report, the the tone of voice, I would say, that's really nice. So before we get into it, I wanted to quickly catch up. Uh, Adam has been falling into the void of Brando Sando. Another victim has fallen. He's oh, been yes. going through the Skyward books, which is yes, a yes. Brandon Sanderson sci-fi series. Yes, it's completely separate universe from the main universe of his. You so say that, but I don't believe you. I think it's all interconnected. <laughs> it's quite possible. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think, really good though. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. All right. I hear only good things about the, the, all those books. So one day... One day I shall read them, but not now. Paul can be, or might be, the only last surviving person. Last man I'm not standing. reading that shit. You are the only person who has not <laughs> read anything Brandon Sanderson on this podcast. Yeah, because I have a life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good no, for I'm you. Just joking. No, I'm, I'm not. The only fantasy I ever got into was The Witcher. That was it. So. Mm. Also it's coming up jam. in the future. Yeah. If you want to do it. Oh, okay. What's oh, really? the okay. like, longest book you've read, Paul? Is, it, is there anything you read that was fiction and it was more than 1,000 pages? Uh, yeah, the, um, was it the Dark Water book mm. that I was talking about before. Oh, I thought it was Written, short. Oh, it's like 30 hours, actually, the oh, audio book. No. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, no. I already um, said yes to that one. Oh, no. Oh, really? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> was it Blackwater? No, it's Blackwater, isn't it? Maybe I found the wrong book because I saw it and I was like, yeah, this is a horror book and it's like 200 pages. Let's go. The guy who wrote uh, Beetlejuice. Oh, never mind. I found something else. God okay, damn it. No, no, no. Well, uh, it was written as a serial, but he put it all together, I think. Is The Way of Kings the longest book you ever read, Adam? Almost certain. I mean, read, listened to, but well, I mean, the yeah. longest I listened to, it's like 60 hours, maybe 70 yes. even. I did the it's same. It's insanely oh my long. I, I like, don't think I've read anything close to that. I have Way of Kings PTSD. I just remembering it, I'm exhausted. So, <laughs> but like great three book. or four books must be over 200 hours long. It's insane. Oh my god! Yeah, so definitely listen to our episode special on the Way of Kings. I'm trying to look up which number episode 26. Definitely check that one out. I suffered hard for that one. Oh yeah, I I, I listened <laughs> to that one. It was good. So like I said, today we'd like to discuss. Uh, the Day of the Triffids by John Windham, or John Windham. How do you how do you read this one? What do you think? Uh, on the audiobook, I think they said Windham. Yeah. That's what they said on Wikipedia. Windham. I always thought it was Windham, but it's definitely not that, right? <laughs> it's just Wind Windham. Definitely not. Okay. Mm. Okay. So I love this so much. I'm completely biased. This is probably the reason I like books. Uh, we talked a little bit before recording that we both read it, me and Adam, very young. And I think this was the first book ever in my life that really hooked me. Because it has none of the parts that I hate about books, which is uh, expensive lore and history, multiple characters, uh, different houses of kings. And and it just gets into it straight away. And I love the beginning. I love the opening scene. And it just hooked me in. And it was the first time I was really, really into like an adventure kind of story. And it felt very real in the sense of not being a happy ending. It was more like a realistic, bleak kind of adventure. 
and really got me like I really loved it when I first read it. How did you guys like this just now? Sorry, what did you say? Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I'll bring it up later. It's fine. You can say that. It's, it's fine. <laughs> no, I was going to ask you. Did you ever? Did either of you ever watch the um, the movies? Yeah, the I TV watched them series? actually today, <laughs> but not all of it. Oh, okay. Parts. The nineteen sixties one. So one of the movies is from nineteen sixty-two, uh, I think. Uh, sixty-three. Yeah. And the other one is two thousand nine. Mm. Oh. It's a TV series, I think. Yeah. And I found it as a compilation, only three hours, the whole TV series. It's very short, just okay. two parts or something. I only watched the, the first part of it, you know, so. And I was like, oh, it's like, they had like Spud from Train Spotting. Do you, do you remember him? <laughs> okay. The weird guy. A little bit. Weird head. Yeah, I think, okay. so. I think I know. I was like, ah, Spud. Anyway, okay. And then the 1960s one was, I just watched the trailer, but it was really like, Typical 60s horror, like dun dun yeah. dun. Yeah, 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 I love the <laughs> opening Plastic credits. Plant and everything. Like... <laughs> the day of the Triffids, when terror reigned from the sky. Ah, like, oh, wow! I can't watch this. It's kind so. of charming. Like I kind of like these old movies, but you have to be in a mood for mm. them. You have to be just you know relaxed and yeah, talk, definitely talk about it with somebody, like chat about it get a little drunk i guess mm. or something just have fun with it just just to watch it as a movie movie it's too old now i think it doesn't hold up no. as well as a movie yeah yeah yeah. it's like a movie night movie mm. so i don't know i assume you liked it as a child right yes very much i i rem rem remember it liking it a lot although i don't remember any actual details from the story before i mm -hmm. re-listened it now um i remember the triffids i still think <laughs> that idea is absolutely amazing Mm -hmm. Volking possible ascension plans, but I didn't know any details of the story actually. I just knew yeah. I really liked it. Now, the reason I really really like this is it's because I re I learned English reading this. It was one of the first books, maybe the first book I ever finished in English. Like the I, I had the abridged version in English. It was like fifty pages, and I read the whole book like after that in English. It was my achievement that I can understand. <laughs> You know the original in English, so that was another like reason for me to like it. So what's your what's your story, Paul? Do you care about this book at all before you started it? Uh, actually, I I found the book by listening to another much higher quality podcast about oh my god sci-fi stuff. Heresy! <laughs> and uh, get out. He was saying it was kind of like um, yes. we well, can always guarantee low production qualities as well. But um, <laughs> yeah, like he was kind of describing it as one of the sort of like kind of the first zombie kind of books. Definitely. Yeah, and when I was listening, re-listening to it today, I was like, yeah, like a lot of zombie movies and stuff are borrowed so much from this, I think. Definitely. One of the first ever post-apocalyptic mm. zombie-like mm. yeah, adventures stories. So I'm very curious. I reread parts of it. I didn't have time to reread or re-listen to the whole thing, but I read the beginning, which I liked a lot, and I read some chapters just randomly to see if it holds up. But I'm very curious what you think, like especially Adam. He can compare it. So does it hold, hold up today? Is it still something people would get into today? I think it's not bad. Um, I, but it has its issues. Um, <laughs> okay. I, it's, for one, it's very much product of its time um, mm. in terms of how, for example, progressive it is. Um, mm. I, I think that Wyndham was very like uh, forward-looking when he... Like came up with the idea of uh, biological engineering, basically, of the Triffids. Hmm. Uh, but he wasn't very progressive looking when it came to women, for example. And that's... <laughs> I, Always the women. <laughs> like, I, I don't mind. I find it interesting to look into the... Like, how people saw the... The, the context, the historical context in which the books was, was written. I always find hmm. it interesting. But here it's very visible. Okay. So that was one, one thing I thought it was like... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I knew you guys would bring that up. Little, the Triffids are actually important to the story, kind of. Not the story itself, but the the events of the story. Like, the Triffids are almost secondary. Yes, it's not um, very important. Yeah, and as, that's and interesting. I remember not many action scenes, like fights with the Triffids. It's very sparse. No, almost nothing. They, if anything, they just run, run away from them. Exactly. So it's not the point. So if you're expecting an adventure where people fight plants and just like, it's not this. No, it's not no, that. It's, it's uh, definitely like a, it's a disaster 
post-apocalypse movie, mm. not uh, not an action movie. Uh, and in, in that sense, it's really interesting. Um, again, like many books of this time, it's uh, the main competent character, which is always nice. I, I like that, but uh, then he isn't super interesting. Mm. And the other characters are parallel characters. Like it's more, it's really the, the book is about the the apocalypse that happened, and how humanity might survive that, and that's really interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with all the ideas presented, but mm. it was in that sense I enjoyed it. The biggest selling point for me then, and hopefully also now, at least from what I reread, is the relatability. Like you can imagine yourself in those situations very easily. Yeah. And I think that's the reason why younger readers love it, because you can put yourself in the shoes of the main character very easily and it feels like you're almost playing a game or something, you're going through it yourself. And maybe that's even the point that the character isn't much of a character, it's more like a... Possibly. Could be you kind of guy. Is of a self-insert character, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so how did you like it, Paul? Yeah, that's a really well-written, great book, and he tells a really great story from the sort of the first-person perspective, and sort of his recollections of what happened in the past and speculation it's all fun and it's really well written and it's really easy to and there's tension i oh, sorry was it in any way predictably boring because there are so many stories like that nowadays like especially the zombie genre no and... no. no definitely not because he, he he does a fantastic job of i think sort of telling it um mm. he, he's a really good writer actually i think his stuff yeah. it, it kept me engaged the whole way um it's interesting i was gonna say guys every time you talk about a book you're always complaining oh portrayals of the women Uh, why do you care so much that's why you are here (laughs) (laughs) no you need a fucking man to fucking send you back what's wrong with you exactly i mean i honestly i i don't really care but here i thought it was like really like "Mm -hmm." i I mean yeah that was like (laughs) 1950 or something wasn't it yeah it's yeah, a product of as I said, the couple of product things. of its time. It's that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just very visible here. There's a couple of things actually it was interesting. My friend said that in, uh, I think UK is recommended reading at school. Hmm. It's like prescribed reading. Hmm. And there's one part at the beginning where they're finding shelter or some some random flat or something, and there's like a mirror on the ceiling of hmm. the bath area. I'm like, <laughs> how's the teacher going to explain that to the students? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't remember that. You don't remember that? <laughs> okay. That's okay. fun. I was like, ooh, this is a kinky kind of house. Uh, and the other part, the first time I listened to it, I just remember the the really religious zealot going, what about the marriage act? Are we oh, going yes. to you know the marriage act <laughs> or something? <laughs> it's just like, okay. Is it the lady in the in the encampment? Like when they, is, is it the lady, what's her name? When they go to the like encampment where the survivors and one of them yes. is very disgruntled, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. the lady, right? Yes. Yeah, and they <laughs> take her leave, yes. She's complaining about, are we just going to... She's a, a really religious lady, mm-hmm. and she mm-hmm. ends up forming her own kind of groups. M- Miss Durand, or D- Durand, or something. Yeah, like yeah, I think that was it, yeah. 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 yeah, I remember that character. The other character was interesting, too. It's very English, actually, I thought. Mm. You know, the, the two main characters, they kind of a little bit sort of rivals at the beginning. Coco and the uh, main character and mm-hmm. uh, later on when they kind of reconcile they're like oh sorry about that chap oh that's okay anyway <laughs> off we go yeah <laughs> it's just like <laughs> I like that it's, it's kind of charming it's, it's sorry fun. I changed you up <laughs> changed you to like a couple of blind brutes but yeah anyway it's all in the past <laughs> <Jolly word. laughs> so it's very English yeah I think that's cool Mm. It's uh, only a mm. only a plus, I can imagine. Yeah, 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 definitely. No, I just want to make one more point. I, I I did think there was some tension with the Triffids, but yeah, it was more like a survival horror kind of thing for me, I guess. Mm. Yeah. The they, action they is not of... the excitement, not the mm. point. It's more about the characters' no. process and no. decisions. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah, true. Which is yeah. which is why I like books. Uh, the movies okay. are especially not that. Mm. Like the movies are like a B horror movie action, you know. Mm. Let, let's let's show the Triffids slashing us like in all the ways and and the effects in the first old movie is kind of hilariously charming, and in the second movie it's just CG, you know, 
CG mm. Jank Horror Fest. So I wouldn't recommend the movies very much. I was about to ask, have okay. you read anything else from John Widom? No, I haven't actually. I've I read don't... almost all of his books, by the way. <laughs> oh. I, I was obsessed after I started like reading in English. This was my like go-to writer and all of his books are very short, very accessible, very easy to get into. And this is the same with like Orson Scott Card, I keep praising. Uh, like you can get into the book quickly, like it gets going. That's why I like it. Like there is like a thing that happens and you just go along with the character and you along with the rides and the uh, things that are introduced are gradually introduced throughout the whole book. And it gives you space to breathe and like take it all in, which I really, really like. As opposed to, sorry to bring it up again, Hyperion, where they dump everything on you in the first chapter and you're just fucked. <laughs> so that's why I also like it. So John Widom was born in 1903, a very long time ago. And his name, I can't read, is too many names. Like, what the hell? Did you see his full name? Oh, wow. No. I'm looking at it now. <laughs> It's John Widom. Parks Lucas Bayon Harris. Bayon Harris. It's like, why do you have so many names? How does that even happen? <laughs> so he started reading, uh, started writing after under, uh, I think, Mr. Harris. Then he changed again to like a different name. And then only after he's written The Day of the Triffids, that was the first book that he wrote under the name John Widom. And it became very popular and became famous for that and stuff like that. But I don't understand all these names. Like. <laughs> Did his mother well as Picasso? Maybe <laughs> I don't know the full extent of Picasso's name. It's like, like seven names, thirty words. Isn't it? What thirty names? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so, I don't know. Maybe he's like kind of uh, connected to some kind of royalty or something. I don't know. Mm. Could be. Maybe maybe there's a point mm. you already brought up with the marriage. Uh, personally, for him, because he didn't get married for a long time because of something called the marriage bar. Have you heard of this? <sighs> No. It's like a historical thing that prevented women from being hired when they were married. And it was just a thing that happened in in the past mm. and he wanted to give his wife a chance to work so they wouldn't marry until it was okay to get married and not lose the job because you were expected to have a child soon if you get married and therefore you're fired, I guess is the reason. I don't really know what this is about, but it's just old times. He also Sounds took like part where in... I live in. <laughs> Terrible. It's not far from the truth. Yeah. So of course he's from Britain and mm. he worked as a cipher operator in the British Army. And also he worked as a censor at the Ministry of Information. His interesting mm. jobs. He also took part in the Normandy landings and a few days after D-Day. Oh really? So he's oh, seen sure. some some important events in his life. I would really mm. recommend all his other books. If you like this one, I would wholeheartedly recommend any of his other books. I was never disappointed. I never read anything that was off-putting or boring. Even if the book was story-wise okay, I always had fun reading it. He has a way to take you on a ride and introduce everything with the characters in a very, not, I don't know, fun, like engaging way, I, I would say. I just mm. like him a lot. He's one of my favorite writers. Kind of wish he wrote mm. more. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to have done a lot for the, uh, wrote a lot in the pulps as well, I guess. Hmm. Mm, the pulp magazines. To... So yeah, mm. I want to say the names correctly of the other books. I'm sure you've heard of some of them. The what is it? The 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 the, the mid. The, yeah, this is the one. The, the Midwich Cuckoos. It's a good one. Oh, Village of the Damned. Oh, okay. Village of the Damned. Wanderers of Time. Uh, Chrysalids. I remember was I liked that one. What mm. is the one with the wives that are robots? <laughs> you know that one. The story. The the Stepford Wives. Stepford Wives. I Stepford think it's somehow wife? connected to him, but I forgot who wrote that. Oh, okay. If he didn't write it, I think there is a very similar story he wrote <laughs> before this. But yeah, I just I just like him. So if you wanted to read anything else, I, I read it. So <laughs> you can do any other episode about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anything I forgot. And in general, I can I don't have to say I recommend it, but would you recommend it to people? Yeah, of course. Uh, overall, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Would you recommend it to people who don't read sci-fi? I mean, it's really yeah. most of the post-apocalyptic team them than straight up sci-fi. So yeah, still mm. sure. I saw some reviews saying that this is why sci-fi is trash. I don't understand why that person said that. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just curious if you think that that's a thing that could happen. It's more of a book about like just problem solving, actually. 
Mm. You know what I mean? Like, there's an issue, and how do we fix it? That's true. And how humans sort of like form groups or form packs, and mm. you know the dynamics of you know how people deal with sort of disaster or other sort of problems. It was very much a big theme and very interestingly described mm. how easy it is yeah. for society to just fall apart and how different the values become. Your values become if you live in a different society that completely deconstructs, decomposes, crumbles apart. Uh, I remember they talked about like jobs and they said, what does it even mean to be a doctor, librarian, whatever in the apocalypse? Mm. It doesn't mean anything anymore. And what would you do in those situations? Like in some part of the books, there are some kind of difficult choices the characters have to make. Like if you saw everybody being blind, would you mm. keep stopping and helping everybody? Like you can't help everybody, but it's difficult to ignore a person who's in need if you're right next to them. Yeah. So in, that yeah. Se- in that sense, it was very emotionally influential, I guess, uh, on me as a teenager. Because I never thought about these things until this book. <laughs> so I think that's why I remember it. And this is not at all in the movie. <laughs> in the movie, they just <laughs> okay. shoot the triffids and run away. That's that's it. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Yeah, that was definitely one of my favorite points, that how we would have to make difficult choices to actually survive the apocalypse. Mm. Yeah, a few actually tidbits I wanted to mention very quickly before we move to the plot. Uh, one very funny thing is that in Czechoslovakia, in 1980s, <laughs> an organization uh, developed an exper- experimental educational summer camp game inspired by the g- by the book. <laughs> and funnily enough, no. me as an English teacher on a summer camp, we also did a game with this because it lends itself very well to many activities and like challenges, such as you know organize blind people and <laughs> stuff like that. So it's funny that there is like a historical record that just Czechoslovakia they they did a game. To- <laughs> <laughs> to teach social children. experiments <laughs> yeah social experiment and another tidbit is that the movie completely changes the ending because the ending oh. is not like depressing in the book but it's kind of bleak but in the movie in the 1963 uh, movie they find out that seawater kills triffids and they just like oh we killed them haha <laughs> <laughs> happy ending <laughs> Well, that makes sense. They're plant, are they? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So you just need to push all the triffids into the ocean. Yeah. Mm. Just spray them with the hose and yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that they don't fit at all in the story for me. Okay. I thought the book's ending's a bit more like it's bleak, but there's sort of a glimmer of hopeful. You know, there's a hope glimmer of that, hope, but you know, we just need to accept it's a tough world reality. But yes. And I have to mention the sequels. There is two. There are two sequels. 2001, The Night of the Triffids, by somebody completely unrelated, uh, writing a story mm-hmm. that's related uh, vaguely, but completely unrelated in the themes and in the way that we like this. So not recommended by anybody. <laughs> but, is it just uh, to avoid any kind of royalty payments or something? <laughs> like, I've changed it enough, I don't have to pay you anything? No, I think it's it's like officially related, but... The story is just an action adventure fighting the Triffids, having a community in a post apocalyptic okay. world. It's like not the themes that are the point of the story. It's just, you know, like a fun horror, like fight fight the monsters kind of deal. And the same goes for the next sequel that's from 2020 that's called The Age of the Triffids. And that one they said is a little better, but it's still, you know, like your average kind of adventure, horror, post-apocalyptic, sci-fi, something. Like, it's it's okay, like, but it's not, you know, it's much longer. It's twice as long, both of these books, as the first book. And they can't accomplish at all what the first book did. So I haven't read them, but I wouldn't recommend them. From Judging from the book cover, I, I think the, the the Night of the Triffids book cover is hilarious. <laughs> And I think that tells you of everything you need to know about the second book <laughs> and also why you shouldn't read it. I put a picture in our notes if you want to see it. If you scroll down, you can see it. So it's very uh, colorful. It's like, it says Triffids on it. <laughs> I think if you look on the on the first book, book cover, it's kind of charming. It's kind of interesting. And this book just says like, okay, it's trash now. <laughs> yeah. when, when did that come out? Uh, 2000, no, no, no. Yes, 2001, The Night yeah. of the Triffids. No, okay. 469 pages. So I thought I would read that because I was excited. I would read, but then I read what it was about and I don't want to read it anymore. So that's a, that's a pass. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, hopefully we have persuaded you to read this. So please read this book. I think it still holds up. And if you read it, don't continue listening. If you don't care, I hate you for it, but let's get into the spoilers. <laughs>
through the book starts with a character called Bill, Bill Mason, is it? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm never <laughs> sure about names. <laughs> so he's a biologist, right? Yes, very much. Yeah. And he gets injured because he works with the Triffids. So how would you describe the Triffids? What's a Triffid? I was going to ask you the same question, maybe. <laughs> Before you saw any pictures, well, what did you imagine? Well, I really listened to a podcast, so I already knew what it was, but yeah. I always imagined them like small tall narrow plants i think in most of the like covers they are presented like really huge i imagine them about the size of a human hmm. maybe a little taller but a couple sort of like tentacles yeah i have a very funny uh way i did funny like i don't know it's not story but just why i imagined them like that there is a czech plant that's called bolshevnik in english it's cow parsnip i don't know what that is in english but it's very common in Czech Republic. And there is a Russian revolution called the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was alive during that time, of course. And she remembers it very much. And the Bolshevik are, uh, let's say, not liked by Czech people, the Bolshevik party. So she would say yeah. that this plant is the Bolshevik. <laughs> and we would have sticks and we would beat it and cut it in half and shit like that. Uh, because it's, I don't sure it's poisonous, but you shouldn't like... I don't know if this was just anti-propaganda of my grandmother, or if this was actually no. based on something that would save me from getting a rash or being poisoned by this plant. But as a child, I loved to beat this shit out of this plant because my grandmother would support it. So I imagine that the Triffids are Bolshevik. <laughs> okay. No, I just checked cow parsnip is an edible plant. So your grandmother was just beating edible plants. Yeah. Because it sounds <laughs> she was just like the... off at the commies. <laughs> sounds like the communists. <laughs> yeah, so she's just fucking taking out her anger on the commies. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my that's mm -hmm. my trifid. So if you see Bolshevnik in the in the in the wild, be careful. Might get you. It, it, it is it is invasive weed in Czech Republic, so yeah, we, we want to weed it out, but it's not dangerous. Yeah. Uh, okay. Get rid of. Yeah, I <laughs> so I was tasked as a as a young Philip to to get rid of it. So in the book, the Triffids are maybe engineered in the Soviet Union. That was yeah. my question. Yes. Okay. What a coincidence. Mm. <laughs> so they are quite large. So also as well, yeah. Um, there's also another thing too at the beginning of the book. They mentioned that um, basically people have put biological weapons perhaps or mm. nuclear weapons into satellites mm. that are just basically hovering around the earth as yeah. well. So all kinds of mm. weird stuff going on and we're not really sure what that means. Mm. And there are more and more Triffids in the wild. And this scientist, biologist is studying them and they have a something like a tendon or like a whip. That they lash with, they have poison in it. Yes. So if you get lashed, it stings yeah. like hell. And this guy got some poison in his eyes. It might yeah, kill you mm -hmm. even if you it get the Instantly like kills you unless uh, they miss or something. Mm. Even just getting it like, on your skin is pretty dangerous. Mm. Yeah. So even if it hits your hand or something, if it's an adult triffid, it will kill you. And so the triffids so can pull their, their roots up and walk. Yeah. Yeah, that's also creepy and they rattle like in the wind or not in the wind or maybe intentionally and maybe they communicate with each other by like strange rattling sounds which also yeah, they use these creeps. sticks on the plant yeah mm. so this biologist uh, he got splashed with the poison in his eyes right mm -hmm. or something happened yes so he's yep. in the hospital and he's got bandages around his eyes and he's just waiting to recover and they tell him all right so Tomorrow, finally, you're going to be fine. You're going to wake up. You're going to take this off and you're going to see this. He keeps flirting with the with the nurse or something. I remember. I don't know. Is that correct? Yeah, so. Not really. Oh, never mind. It's kind of surly with the nurses, actually. Maybe that was just the movie influencing me because in the movie, he was very, very curious what the nurse looks like. <laughs> when he wakes You've up. also missed the point that he's not really, he's studying the triffids, but he's also working on a triffid farm. They're farming the triffids hmm. for their oil because they produce more oil yeah, yes, than, say, like, uh, sea sea creatures or whales or whatever so uh it's a way to feed the population mm. yeah yeah it was interesting how they essentially presumably russia bioengineered these weapons then they accidentally released them i think they crashed a plane or something and then people figured out that while they are dangerous they're also quite useful they can they harvest the oil from them mm. and they put them in their gardens as a pets I think that's hilarious. <laughs> Maybe you gotta cut off the stinger or something. Yeah, so. yeah, just cut off the dangerous part and keep bio mm -hmm. biological mm -hmm. weapon in your garden. Great pet, yes. I mean, it sounds fun to have a walking plant like here. Uh... Just have to trim it every year so it doesn't kill you or something. Mm -hmm. yep. Jesus. Yeah. So, how do the seeds get out? The um, A guy was trying to smuggle the seeds 
to a company to to sell oh, them. Oh yes, yes. And the Russians kind of got a hold of his plane and shot it down, and the seeds oh. sort of just dispersed into the uh, the jet stream and just gone nice. all over the world. So basically, the whole planet is just covered with triffids. I thought this is your favorite book, Philip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just was trying to, you know, be brief. <laughs> you want to get out of here? All right, time? sure. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's why you are uh, here you, you it's much pressure in your mind so please fill in all the details i'm very happy uh, you sure. brought it up important ones mm. so um, okay so he's in hospital with the bandages and he said yes and an astrological astronomical what's the correct word astronomic no something shit goes down in the sky <laughs> yeah it's like a meteor shower like basically okay it's yeah. an event and so it's really bright and colorful and everything mm -hmm. like this mm. and people are planning to watch it it's, it's announced that it's going to be spectacular so everybody kind of want to see it is it correct yeah yeah pretty much the entire planet i'm not sure how it kind of works with uh, like mm. the entire planet watches it i guess it was very long but yeah. so the mm. premise everybody who saw it goes completely irreversibly blind and some people luckily don't like our protagonist who finally uh, takes off so first he tries to call the nurse and he tries to like call people and nobody responds and then he hears some strange noises and then he finally decides to take the bandages of his face and of his eyes himself and I, I remember this moment how he is very very relieved and very happy that he can see because until that moment he wasn't sure that he could see he would be able to see after the recovery or if his uh, vision was impaired in any way and he has this uh, relief like everything's okay and then immediately crushed by something is horribly wrong and I don't know what. And he starts walking around the hospital and there is mess everywhere and stuff on the ground. And he finds people who are completely confused and he doesn't know what to do with them. And then slowly we find out that 99% of the population in Britain is blind now because of the event. And everything just goes to hell. Like, have you ever seen that movie 28 Days Later? That's Yeah, yeah that's credited as... Direct inspiration from this book, exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Mm. I think from this part of the book, there is also a somewhat famous quote. When a day that you happen to know is Wednesday starts off by sounding like Sunday, there is something <laughs> seriously wrong somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I just read that quote. That's a great quote. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is an adventure throughout the apocalypse. And uh, I'm not sure how much we should get into this. What details do you want to mention? Like there's the survival group and then he goes here and there and then... Stuff happens. Well, he's kind of considering his options at this point, what he should do, actually. He, as far as... He doesn't really have a family to try to save, presumably. So he's kind of thinking what to do, which in the end leads him to the university. Uh, mm. No, wait a minute. How does he get to... The, no, he first finds Gisela. So he mm. finds Gisela. He, she's, like, tied to this other blind guy who's using yeah. her as his his guy. Like seen eye dog or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> Uh, so he rescues her and together they find shelter, stuff like that. I'm not sure I remember what happens. Like, does he push the guy away or what, what does he do? Does he kill him? I, I know. He just clogs him, I think. Yeah, yeah there is like short fight, I think, but I think mm. major. In the movie, there is also a discussion with the doctor of the hospital, like the uh, person who was responsible, like the eye doctor. And... They have a discussion and then the doctor commits suicide by jumping out of the window because he realizes what oh, happened. Yes. Is that in the book too? It's the same in the book. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he gets to this uh, university and that's where the survival group resides. And they see like uh, at night, they see a light coming from the university. So mm. they head there the next day to find out that there is a survival group being organized. But this is another guy there. So the guy we are talking about? Mm. Coco. Yes. Yes. So he is trying to take care of the blind people and he's saying that you know we just need to hold out a little bit longer and you know help will come eventually you know we have a responsibility he's kind of being quite moralist moralistic about it saying you know we we can't just leave these people to die kind of thing so he yeah. he's still holding on that someone will come and the people in the university are like no this is it it's all over we gotta really just be realistic about what we can and can't do and there's a bit of like a i think the university people shoot sort of a gun into the air and sort of scare them off kind of thing so this is when miss miss durant comes up or not no oh, that's like oh kind of i guess yeah because they have this like a yeah. uh, session at the university to decide what's going to happen next mm -hmm. and they decide that uh, they they have like a professor of uh, i don't know it was sociology or something like that and he talks about how we have to throw away our customs and things we were used to because this is the apocalypse and uh, mm. 
for sake of survival of the species, mm. we have to make some serious changes and suggest <laughs> that basically we can help everyone, that it's just not possible. We will just be prolonging their death mm -hmm. and eventually we will all die. That unfortunately we have to kind of pick and choose some of them. I think they... Uh, they have some blind people there and they took them from some institution where there were blind people so that they are actually like used oh, yeah, to yeah, being yeah, blind that are kind of it. useful mm -hmm. and, and they're mostly women too yes yes and that's yes. the other thing mm -hmm. that uh for the survival of the species we need a lot of babies so here are women blind but useful <laughs> just an idea so polygamy is encouraged yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, I, I yes. actually, I'm not sure if it, yeah, I guess it does, uh, they do say it here, yes, that polygamy would be necessary. And that's the reason why this lady disagrees, she's kind of... Yes, because she's like, uh, I, I'm not sure if she's a nun or in general just uh, religious and she mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't like that, no. And she wants to help, I'm not sure if she actually kind of, she maybe agrees that she can't help everyone although i'm not mm. sure but she definitely is against the polygamy that, that's a... yeah she's very christian and yes you know. i like a lot that they have a lot of views on the situation and what people would believe is the right thing to do without preaching anything just like asking the questions and uh, having different people perspective on it so i like that a lot so then they have this system i'm not sure if it's also in this group or later where they have like blind assistants and they tie them together and they have like a helper oh, that, that happens uh, right later. after this uh, i think so where there is kind of a coup hap kind of kind of a coup happens at the university where there is a group that doesn't agree uh, well it's the it's the guy that was at the at the gate i coco. think coco. Mm -hmm. it's coco uh, yeah coco lures some of them out with a fake fire mm -hmm. yeah he tricks them and then he captures them so he mm -hmm. captures uh, joanna is it Joanna and uh, Bill? Gisela. Gisela. And yeah. Gisela, sorry. Yeah. And basically, yeah, he is the guy that's trying to basically help all the blind people, but he's sort of taken drastic measures. He captures some of the members of the group and he chains them to basically some others. Uh, basically, chains them to like kind of bodyguards who will sort of make sure he doesn't get away and then assist. Mm. Or drive around the city and try to find goods or materials for the blind people. Yeah. Uh, I remember the scavenge, scavenging hound hunt when they are tied to a blind person and they're trying to pick up stuff, which is the reason they adapted this into all these games. <laughs> into what? Into all these uh, children games that you have always one person and uh, it's like two other children tied to them without uh, sight and they have to guide them and, you know, <laughs> so that's why that happened. Now this is basically where we first guy no not the first time we run into the Triffid first with Gisela and her parents who are killed mm. by them. Uh but this is kind of the second time we run into them roaming the streets because the area of London they have been assigned to like scavenge in. Uh it's also infested by Triffids, so they have some losses but successfully run away. I actually I'm not sure I'm not sure the blind people survive that. I don't think so. This this is the point uh, where uh, Bill actually like separated from the group he was supposed to. Yeah, I'm not sure how that happens. I guess they get attacked and in the chaos yes, he escapes. Yes, they get attacked. Yeah, and he yeah the um, kind of a militia leader kind of attacks them. Oh, he, he okay. kind of pops up again later in the story. Oh, yes, um, yes. But yeah, he shoots uh, at Bill, but ends up hitting one of his sort of bodyguards that he's chained to, and uh, mm. that's how uh, basically knocks out the other guy and finds a key and escapes. Uh, yeah. There's another key point too, is that Bill, because he's been working with the Triffids, uh, he also scavenges a lot of uh, anti-Triffid kind of weapons and guns and mm. things like that, where the leader of the uh, the group at the university was kind of a bit sort of dis sort of dismissing that, like, why, why do you need all that? The Triffids aren't the issue at the moment, mm. or at all kind of thing. Yeah. You know, that is kind of a nuisance, but uh, they're not anything to be concerned about. So. I did find it kind of... I'm not sure if it was explained. I don't think it was very well explained why there are suddenly so many dangerous Triffids. Because, like, in, in London at least, because if people had them in their gardens, then they were trimmed. They didn't have mm. the the stinger. Presumably in the countryside, uh, the Triffids ran away from the farms. I'm not sure why they had the stingers. If they actually harvest the stingers for the oil. Yes. No, wait. There was an important point at the beginning one of Bill's co-workers who's really heavily researching the Triffids 
they, he discovered that when you kept the stinger on the triffids, you could actually harvest more oil from them. Ah, I see. Yeah, I, I suspected it's something like that. Yeah. Although, again, I'm not sure why so many of them were like with the stinger in London. That was kind of strange. Yeah, they often talked about like the triffids would sometimes escape and they just sort of hoard them back into like another pen kind of thing. So they, they you know, they are kind of sneaky. Um, but they've always had people sort of watching them and sort of uh, kind of rounding them up kind of thing. Yeah. But um, the researcher said, look, you know, he was saying that you know if humans lose our sight. You know, he would back the Triffids. So that was kind of hinted at, at the beginning. Yeah, so. Wasn't there a point that some time passed, like when they lived in the encampment, and that's why the stingers grew back after being trimmed? Yeah, after a couple of years, yeah, they come, they grow back. And that's why there are so many dangerous Triffids, I guess? No, there are so many because they ran away from the farms where they yes. were not mm. trimmed. Okay. Mm. I also remember he encounters a small girl who is hiding in the house and her brother is killed by the Triffids in the garden. There's like a scene. That, that's, I think that's a lot uh, later. Later? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry, we are I'll, jumping I'll forward a lot I'll, there. Uh, I'll now, shut up. We got rid of the bodyguards now. Um, <laughs> however, Bill is uh, still, like he returns back to the group that he was helping scavenge supplies for because he kind of doesn't want to leave them. Not very nice of like to just leave them there. However, that issue kind of resolves itself because there is uh, this mysterious plague that basically kills everyone. Um, yeah, at first I think it's like typhoid or, typhoid or something, yeah. but uh, usually typhoid takes a lot longer. So it's something they don't know. What is this? But it's basically yeah, wiping out a lot of people in London. And because of the state of society, it's very difficult to do something about it. So it's a completely different perspective on it. Yeah. Uh, however, he does not know where Gisela went. I think he figures out which area of London she was assigned to, but she's not there anymore. And so he returns to the university and there he finds like a note saying the where most of the group went, which is this big country house. It's not, uh, it's like a um, estate perhaps. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, so he heads there. When he gets there, he finds out that it's um, the religious zealot Christian lady who was against mm. the, uh, or was worried about the marriage act. She's formed her own little kind of community that, and she doesn't know where Gisela has gone at all. But I think later she kind of misdirects them into a different area. And Coco actually appears oh, yeah. here again. Yes. On the way to the to this place, he meets Coco again. Who yeah, yeah, yeah. That. that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like, oh, sorry about that whole oh, misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, uh, that's the... Chaining oh, you up yes, to yes. a couple of guys. It's all good. Yeah, well, all right, off we go. It, it wasn't it's a great idea. It's so English. <laughs> was it a great idea? Yeah. Did it quite work out? Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's like, yeah. Yeah, I was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. It's in so many movies after this. All these people with different ideals setting up their little communities and trying to protect them and enforce some kind of laws. It's influenced so many zombie yeah. apocalyptic stories. It's very much a Walking Dead kind of thing that even though I've never watched it, but yeah. Same with the mm. Last of Us and all these like it's very similar kind of setup. Yeah, definitely. So this one was the first, I guess. Yeah. Uh so him and Coco are now a, a, a duo, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I'd feel about that, actually. I'd yeah. probably, like, shoot the guy. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's not very comfortable of <laughs> company. They, they made friends very quickly. Like, yes. <laughs> I, I guess it was necessity in the, like, context yeah, of the situation. Kind of. So, anyway, Coco is quite a resourceful kind of guy. And he's quite sort of um, self-taught, very highly educated. I think quite a, a, a good speaker. And then he kind of realizes that quickly at the um, the new community formed by the, uh, what was her name? The Christian lady? I always forget. Durant or Dar Durant. Durant. Okay. Or... Yeah, yeah so Miss Durant, Durant like, I think. Yeah, Miss mm -hmm. Durant. Okay. Uh, this place is going to fall apart so quick. Yeah, they have no idea what they are doing. Mm. And she needs help, but she's so stubborn. She's just refusing to even you know ask for it. So exactly. he decides that, all right, Coco and Bill decide to come. Go on their journey and find uh, Gisela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Gisela. <laughs> it's really weird. Yeah. Okay. And the rest of the group that were at the university. Um, yes, yes. Uh, what was the guy, the leader of the group? University group? I forgot his name. He's Beadley, kind of maybe? And there's another guy, like a general. Maybe Beadley? Beadley? Yes, that's it. Yes. Or Be Beasley or Beadley or something, yes. Beadley. Beadley. And I think that's when they come across the little girl? Maybe. Eventually, I, f I think that... No, but they, they, they start searching the countryside, basically, for them. They mm. can't find them. At some 
point. I think Coco decides, or they split. I'm not sure yes. for what reason now, but they split. And at this point, uh, Bill runs across this girl, managed to survive till now, uh, hiding in her house while most of her family was also slowly killed by the Triffids. So he That's takes right. her and he runs across... Does he run across the armored, armed group again? Or no, that's probably a different arm. He show up later at the end, the very end. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Oh, that, yes. No, that's probably a different armed group that they run. In. Oh, oh, yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Basically, now they he finds another group of people who raided like a army base, I think, with mm. a bunch of weapons, preparing for the apocalypse. Uh, for all the people from London to come in and uh, eat all the food. Mm, Turns out all the right. people in London are dead, so that's probably not going to happen. I thought there was just one military group, so once again I'll shut up. <laughs> not sure. Well, it was like a small group, it was just a couple of people. Um, yeah, they didn't really have, they were really out of the loop. They had no idea mm. what was kind of going on. Uh, and then I think with that little group he forms and he finally f comes across uh, his woman. He continues searching for her with them mm. until they give up, basically. But at some point he finally remembers that she mentioned this house somewhere mm. and heads to that place and actually finds it so they stay there for some time and she's living with like two or three other people i guess i can't remember exactly yeah yeah because there was some someone already living in the house uh Gisela came i think she may have brought some people too mm. uh, so there are a couple of people some blind some sighted and then uh bill arrives with the girl and they actually stay there for quite a long time yeah i think so yeah basically they have everything already there kind of thing they're quite self-sufficient so mm. i remember they had kind of a good deal going there and then yes yes and then finally a helicopter shows up one day mm. yes. yes random helicopter uh, shows up they manage to like attract its attention and it turns out it's uh, the beadless faction beadly yes and they've all moved to the isle of Rob white and uh basically sort of wiped out the island of triffids and basically are forming a base there uh, of course every spring or something they have to do kind of like a roundup of sort of new triffids that have popped up but basically they've eradicated them from the island so far triffids can't swim so they're safe <laughs> well they're allergic to salt water <laughs> <laughs> as he found out in the movie yeah. <laughs> um yeah so far um maybe i could write a new book these mutated <laughs> triffids who can <laughs> walk into the water um <laughs> so they're kind of working on some kind of biological weapon to uh maybe wipe out the triffids mm. um, yeah, but they don't really have the knowledge to do so so okay, they won't so. be able to join them ideally and he's just like yeah sure but um it's kind of nice so we would like to stay the summer <laughs> before we join <laughs> <bit> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah now at the end as well it's hinted at that the plague, well, Bill was speculating that at the beginning with these satellites that are maybe certain countries have put up into space, maybe one of them, a meteor hit and released some kind of biological weapon mm. okay. into the atmosphere that has caused a plague and sort of wiped out. So the meteor shower wasn't probably a natural occurrence. It was probably mm. something possibly from uh, the weapons that are kind of floating around up up in space now uh, one other thing at the end as well before they uh, they decide they're going to have their vacation um the military group that uh, shot at bill the ginger head guy at the beginning yeah. uh mm -hmm. he shows up at the house and says uh we've um, forming like a, a military and we have um a rule there is like one person has to take care of 12 blind people or something like this yeah. and uh you, you and we're going to take Susan away because she's uh, technically not your daughter and assign mm -hmm. her somewhere else kind of thing. So another group of people mm -hmm. trying to enforce their way on them uh, after yes. they've been yeah. kind of doing well for a while, but not for long. So Bill hatches the plan to get him drunk and basically puts like honey into the gas tank, the big military mm -hmm. vehicle. And uh, this time as well, like, the Triffids are kind of really breaking in to, through the, um, the, the fences and everything. Yeah, and they're kind of like surrounding the house and sort of like pushing themselves up against the mm. defenses and houses. They do have a certain level of intelligence, I guess. Uh, they're yeah. communicating with each other and sort of forming strategies. And when they were electri like electrifying the fence, um, they're only kind of doing it in the morning and the afternoon, but the Triffids were kind of learning when they were doing it. So they had to kind of change the patterns mm. and stuff. So the Triffids were kind of adapting as well. I like so, that part a lot. Mm. It was kind of creepy. Mm. Like they were... Finding out more and more mm. about the Triffids, what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, how they kind of like swamped around the house and sort of pushed mm. them all themselves against the windows and stuff. Yeah. That's sort of very claustrophobic and 
kind of mm-hmm. very weird and creepy. Different type of horror than running bleeding zombies. That's pretty much it. Uh, they mm. play along with this self-appointed government uh, mm. long enough to sabotage their vehicle and mm. run away and join the Isle of Wight faction. Yeah. So they're going to the yeah, island that is pretty home, much the end but... of the book. Yeah. Exactly. So the sequels pick up when they live on the island and they try to develop the weapons and they try to fight the Triffids and all that, but it's just the, just the like usual story to fight and survive. There's not much else about it. I, I'm not surprised there are sequels. It's pretty open, to the ending. But I think it's not yeah. unsatisfying how it ended. Well, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a very sort of realistic ending. Yeah. It leaves you things to speculate what could happen in the future. Yeah, I mean... It doesn't wrap everything up in a nice little kind of neat package or anything exactly. like that. Exactly. So, yeah. It's like a very yeah. thought provoking ending or doesn't tell you all the answers, like you said. So, Paul approved. Doesn't force the answers down your throat like <laughs> Orson Scott Card. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the narrator in the audiobook is really good. He, he does yeah. an excellent job of uh, okay. uh, his pacing and okay. intonation and. You know, I should check that out. Like, the clip. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, it's very suitable for the uh, the time period of the book. Thank you so much for summing it up. I forgot all of the details. I should have reread it, but <laughs> especially with other books that I hated. <laughs> so, if you if you're up I for love it, this book so much, but I can't remember a thing about it. <laughs> this, I remember it. I just don't remember like the order and the details. Well, I just listened to it today, so it's, it's mm. still fresh in the mind. Okay, mm. thanks for doing that. Uh, no worries. Um, like I said, if you're curious about any other books from John Widom, I'm very much interested and I would very much reread those. So <laughs> unless there's anything else you'd like to say, I think that's it. I think it's uh, a fun zombie book. <laughs> really appreciate that it's not zombies and it's zombies and Triffids and the zombies are not zombies and it's just a different spin on it that's more interesting. It lends itself to more interesting situations and more choices. Well, I don't think you can say put a spin on it because I think he's the one that's probably like pioneered it hasn't it yeah so it's the original yeah, much. like before the dumb mm. zombie stories this is like a more clever way to tell the same thing but have more depth to it because uh... the people are people they're not zombies but they are kind of useless so you have to take much more into account if yeah. you have a zombie that's completely mindless bleeding and dead then you have no moral quandary to kill them immediately but you know mm. if you have if you're surrounded with normal people who just can't be helped because they can't see it's it's a much more difficult way to decide or do anything so thanks a lot for joining me i really enjoyed reliving this adventure i hope that we con- persuaded somebody to read it if you're still listening and you haven't read it i think you can still get something out of it <laughs> even if you know what happened so yeah i think thanks. it's a really easy book to read too so yeah, yeah. exactly super easy to read gateway to reading please mm. read it <laughs> so thanks for listening and see you on the next episode right, thanks hey goodbye because this was a shorter episode i got uh, two quotes i liked a lot so one point i liked was that people are kind of sheeple and uh, what can happen in these apocalyptic scenarios is that some people just can't be helped Uh, the quote is most people prefer to be coaxed or wheeled or even driven that way they never make a mistake if there is one it's always due to something or somebody else so this is pretty much something i kept thinking about while reading it like a theme that in all these morally ambiguous situations do you help those people do you not help those people a lot of people are very indecisive and they just let other people to decide and then that's how you get all these bastards uh, in power like coco another thing that came up that i liked a lot was that you have to be resourceful in an apocalypse surprise (laughs) and you have to uh, be willing to learn things uh, which many people in the modern world are not and it's very difficult for them to change when they actually are forced into a situation where unless they learn new things and unless they try and fail and by trial and error just survive they will not survive so this is a quote from a situation where a religious character is claiming that she doesn't have the brains to learn anything technical which happens all the time in in our world. It's not my fault if I'm not any good at things like that. I'll differ there, Coker told her. It's not only your fault, it's a self-created fault. Moreover, it's an affectation to consider yourself too spiritual to understand anything mechanical. It is a petty and a very silly form of vanity. 
Everyone starts by knowing nothing about anything, but God gives him brains to find out with. Failure to use them is not a virtue to be praised.